is Lobia sparring actually the best you can do to learn real fencing? Hello there, Martin here from Schiffer Potsdam. And recently the discussion popped up once more if low gear or low gear fencing has an actual value to learn sword play. And in this hopefully very short video, I want to give you a metric not only to assess the risk that you and the risk you are taking when you are fencing and sparring and sword fighting with your friends, but also an approach to go for what I think is a productive training. Okay, so first let's talk about risk assessment. Any activity that we are doing has some kind of risk and the outcomes that are possible when doing any activity but sword fighting in particular are ranging between no injuries at all and death. Well, that's just that. But we can influence the probabilities that these different outcomes have. So for example, when you are fencing with a foam sword and you have a fencing mask on and you have protected fingers, then it's probably really, really hard to die from that activity. Well, there are still other factors that uh, could make this possible, so it's uh, never say never, but uh, it's probably not from getting hit with a foam sword, okay? On the other hand, if you are playing with sharp swords, you significantly increase the probability that if someone makes a mistake that you got impaled and there is still a risk to die from that. So not to say that no gear fencing has like a huge risk that you'll immediately uh, just fall over into the other sword, get poked through the eye and just die from there. But you should be always very aware of the risks that you are taking. And they're basically what I think three factors that have the main influence on that risk for you uh, while fencing. And the first one is the actual gear you use. So not only the protective gear, but also, of course, the weapons that you are using. If you use a flexible sword, uh, if you're using blunt edges, if you're using maybe a foam sword or a nylon sword, this all will have an influence. It's harder to get hurt by a wide edge that disperses the energy of an incoming blow than it is, of course, from a sharp edge. Padding will absorb some of that energy and deliver it for a longer time, so it will protect you and if your fabric that you're using is uh, thrust resistant, this will add another layer of protection as well. If you're protecting your eyes, then of course your eyes are less likely to get stabbed through. Okay, so this is the first factor, the gear you are using. The second and probably more important one though, is the actual rules that you are using. And by rules, I don't mean necessarily that you have written down a rule set, but also club culture plays in here. Basically, it's the mix of the intent of the fences and then the intensity that the fencing is employed. So what do I mean by that? Intent basically stands for if you actually want to hit your opponent and uh, what strikes are allowed. So for example, I've been doing this for over 15 years now and I started uh, in reenactment where we wore open face helmets. So naturally thrusting with a fairly stiff blade, one have to, has to say, uh, to the face was not permitted because of safety reasons. And uh, I hope that's quite clear why that's the case. Um, so this is intent, okay? You could try to actually hit the opponent, you can try to stop, but that's just one side of this coin. The other one is the intensity, and that's the actual uh, force you are employing, that's the speed at, that you are going at. So this makes a huge difference as well, and it's also something why we see, for example, low gear sparring often combined with 
slow speed sparring or uh, slow motion sparring because these different components play into the overall risk of getting hurt in your training. Okay, so while no, uh, putting on no gear increases the risk, having an intent to never hit your, act uh, your opponent actually and going at a low speed can significantly reduce the risk once again. So overall, and that's a very important thing to keep in mind, uh, it's not that unambiguous what type of sparring is actually safer. Okay, what do I mean by that? If you're putting on full gear and you're hitting each other with whatever feathers, blunt swords, but you're going full speed, full intensity, and you really try to whack each other with that sword over your head, well, that might actually be more dangerous than going low speed uh, with blunt weapons in no gear. Okay, because for example, getting hit really hard into the head has a really significant risk of a concussion and that's of course bad for you. Okay, while well, the risk of getting stepped through the eye going low speed in a controlled environment can be fairly low. But, <laughs> but uh, you always have to be aware of the consequences of any of these outcomes. So for example, uh, once again, getting stepped through the eye, well, that's a really severe injury. So for example, while I have done a lot of uh, no gear and slow motion or uh, like low intensity sparring, um, I would probably wouldn't do that anymore. Why? Because if you do an activity for long enough, then even these low probabilities, they will, they will manifest themselves and you'll just get that injury. You get that mistake, that low probability that both participants make a mistake. For example, no one actually wants to teach each other, but both uh, went a step forward and it just happens, okay? And this can always occur and it doesn't really need to be like the intention of the, uh, of the fencing partners. It's just a mistake, it can happen. And if you do something long enough, it probably will happen. So once again, for example, while doing reenactment, uh, I was fencing with a couple of opponents and like I said, uh, no thrust to the face were allowed. And I was even wearing a full plate helmet. So there were just little eye slits. And accidentally, one time within these uh, 15 years, a blade got caught in the eye slit it hit me uh, right under the eyebrow. Actually, my contact lenses ripped apart, saved my eye, luckily. And so I had very much luck in that situation, but it only tells you, well, you need to, you only need to do something long enough and something bad will happen or the worst possible outcome will happen. Okay, so that's something why I uh, nowadays only train with a fencing mask, for example. and. Um, I would suggest that you'll do that as well. Okay, so just keep that in mind. You have different factors. These play together for the overall risk that you're taking in your activity. Okay, this is one thing. Then the other is the approach to training. And we'll have to keep in mind first and foremost that all of our training is a simulation. It's a simulation because none of us hopefully, <laughs> none of us actually tries to kill our partners, our fencing partners, our opponents. As was the context of quite a couple of the sources that we are working with, okay? So that's some part of actual fencing, actual sword fighting, that you'll never be able to replicate. The intent to actually hurt your opponent. And if you find someone with that intent, I'll probably just call the cops. <laughs> Okay, so there's always some bullshit in our simulation, all right? And we'll have to be, again, very aware of the, that bullshit. So for example, if we don't want to actually hit our opponent because the gear that we're using uh, doesn't allow for it. So for example, we don't wear a fencing mask and therefore we don't thrust uh, for the head. Okay, so we either stop short or we go wide or anything like this. 
this will always introduce some artifact into your fencing, some bullshit. And in my opinion, it's very important that you get different kinds of simulations, different kinds of training environments that have different kind of bullshit built into them. So that in the overall picture, if you know what you can take from each and dif uh, different training environment, that you have a solid foundation and a solid idea about how fencing actually looks like. Okay, so you have some training environments where you can go fast and hard, but you also be very aware that going with blunt swords and full gear introduces, for example, the artifact that you're feeling too safe, that you are not respecting the blade properly. Then on the other hand, if you're going low gear, you're not having the intent to actually hit your opponent. So there's always some bullshit built in there, okay? And being very aware what that bullshit is and training around it can lead you to actually understanding the sources that we're working with. Last up, um, it's, I'll just want to advertise for the Bolognese sources once again. So the sources from 16th century Bologna that I'm working with, because they don't only describe the play with the sharp swords, meant for war, meant for killing the opponent, the spada da filo, sharp sword, but they also describe a lot of plays for the spada da gioco. Literally, this play sword, it's blunt. And it's meant uh, not to kill your partners, but actually for playing with them, for learning sword fighting, for competing, for doing a sport, which for me at least, uh, it's really, really nice because I like that kind of fencing. I like to, to play with my partners, to enjoy exploring this, this wonderful activity that we're all participating in. Okay, so having a source that already focuses on that kind of activity makes it really nice for me uh, to explore these actions because that's quite exactly the context that these techniques were implied. Okay, if you want to learn more about the Bolognese sources, you can uh, explore this channel. You can also head over on Patreon where I do some online courses and live classes. Until then, take care and ciao.